Cutting edge effects technology isn't always used to create cool explosions and giant robots. Released nearly 30 years after the original film, Tron Legacy is a computerized adventure packed with light cycles and daft punk music. Most importantly, this 2010 Disney film gave audiences double the dude. Jeff Bridges returned to the Tron universe as two separate characters. First, there's the heroic Kevin Flynn who looks exactly like the older actor. But then there's Clue, the artificial intelligence gone rogue. And while he was played by a man in his 60s, this evil computer program looks more or less like Bridges did back in the 80s. VFX Super Supervisor Eric Barba oversaw the transformation. He achieved it with a four-camera head-mounted system that Bridges wore on the set to get a floating 3D point cloud of his face. The effect may look a little computery, but that's okay because, after all, Clue is a computer program. The tragic death of Paul Walker in 2013 sent a massive shockwave through the Fast and Furious community. After all, this is a franchise about family, and both Walker and his character of Brian O'Connor were super important to a whole lot of people. His death had serious implications for the production of Furious 7 as the actor died during filming. Fortunately, Weta Digital was able to save the day and preserve Walker's legacy for Fast and Furious fans around the world. The folks at Weta digitally created a whopping 350 shots of Walker, doing everything from jumping skyscrapers to standing in a lineup with the rest of his crew. Additionally, Walker's brothers Caleb and Cody and actor John Brotherton gave motion capture performances that Weta used to recreate Brian. Thanks to their incredible work, he got to ride with his family one last time. When Kevin Spacey was accused by multiple victims of sexual assault, director Ridley Scott made one of the gutsiest decisions in Hollywood history. Spacey and Scott had recently finished working on All the Money in the World when the scandal broke. Unwilling to keep Spacey in the film, Scott replaced the actor with Christopher Plummer, reshooting every scene featuring Spacey's character, stingy billionaire J. Paul Getty. It was an unprecedented move, and it cost $10 million to exercise Spacey from the film. Most of these scenes were done practically, with other actors on actual sets, but there is one quick moment in which Scott resorted to some digital trickery. For a scene in which Getty goes to Jordan, it was too impractical to go all the way back to the Middle East, so Plummer was shot in front of a green screen, and after the special effects crew digitally erased Spacey, they just slid Plummer right into place. 2017's Blade Runner 2049 was a beautiful follow-up to the original 1982 Blade Runner. It saw the return of Harrison Ford as Rick Decker, but he wasn't the only original cast member to come back. During one key scene, the aging Deckard is confronted by a ghost from his past. It's Rachel, the replicant he fell in love with in the first film. Only, this isn't the Rachel that Deckard remembers. That Rachel is dead. This is a new shiny one, created solely to tempt Deckard to the dark side. And this isn't exactly the actress we remember either. In in order to de-age Sean Young by over 30 years, the moving picture company analyzed photos of her, studied scenes from the first film, and even checked out Young's other performances from around the same era. They also photographed Young with a special device that captured her likeness from multiple angles. With all these references, they were able to create a CGI face that they could then layer onto a body double who shot the scene with Ford with Young standing by as an advisor. Unlike many digital creations, the Rachel of 2049 looks incredibly lifelike, which is kind of perfect for a movie that wonders what makes us human. In this film about adult friends playing a game of tag for years and years, Jeremy Renner is an uncatchable man. He's been evading his buddies by moving like an Olympic athlete and dodging outstretched hands like he's in the Matrix. During one of these escape scenes, Renner jumped on top of a huge stack of chairs, which resulted in disaster when the rigging that held the chairs in place snapped and sent him tumbling. When Renner got up, he realized he'd broken both his arms. As he explained to Entertainment Weekly, he could still move his limbs up and down kind of like a robot, so he didn't need too much digital assistance. However, there is one moment when the VFX crew had to create a completely CG arm, and it's in the very scene where his stunt went wrong, specifically when he tosses a donut at Ed Helms. Needless to say, we're legitimately impressed that Renner could deal with all that pain and continue filming. Whenever you see a nude scene in a movie, there's a good chance that nobody on set ever really got naked. Often, actors wear flesh-colored underwear, and for most movies, this is enough because intimate scenes don't really factor into the plot. Not true for the film adaptation of Fifty Shades of Grey. Those scenes are the plot, which posed a unique problem for the effects department. Specifically because it showed more skin than most other films do, a decision needed to be made about whether or not Dakota Johnson's character, Anastasia Steele, had a personal grooming routine. Apparently, she didn't, because a digital effects artist had to go in during post-production and use CGI to give Johnson, um, one of these. Cinematographer Seamus McGarvey would later refer to this as one of the most surreal moments of his entire career. 
closely followed by overseeing the hiring process of a suitable butt double for Johnson. It's safe to say that Nicolas Cage loves comic books. His son Cal L is named after Superman. He changed his own last name early in his career from Coppola to Cage as a nod to Marvel character Luke Cage, and he even has a large tattoo of the Ghost Rider on his arm. This latter tribute proved to be a problem when Cage was set to star in the 2007 Ghost Rider film because, well, it would have been kind of weird for Johnny Blaze to have a tattoo of his own superhero alter ego on his bicep. So the decision was made to use the magic of special effects to hide the offending tattoo whenever Cage needed to take off his shirt. A persistent rumor surrounding the movie suggests that Cage's abs were also created using the magic of CGI. However, his Ghost Rider co-star Ava Mendez has confirmed they were in fact 100% real. There is a scene in the first season of Game of Thrones when the character Hodor, played by actor Christian Naren, gets naked, revealing the giant character's suitably plus-sized anatomy. To achieve the illusion, Naren was asked to wear a realistic-looking 16-inch prosthetic that was attached to his groin using glue. So, for weeks later, I would be finding pieces of prosthetic penis. Um, attached to my own. The effects department then blended the whole thing to his body using digital effects, airbrushing out a special thong Naren was wearing beneath the whole getup. According to the actor, this thong shielded his actual package from view so well that one of his co-stars asked if it was real. There's only one response to that question. Hold on. If you happen to catch Pee-wee's Big Holiday on Netflix, you may have noticed that actor Paul Rubens looked surprisingly spry and youthful for a 60-something-year-old man. To give the impression that Rubens hadn't aged since his last TV appearance as the character, CGI was used in tandem with makeup, lighting, and sticky tape to de-age the actor. And that last part isn't a joke. Tape was used to pull back Rubens' face for some scenes to make his skin look smoother. Sometimes the simplest solutions are the best ones. To his credit, Rubens was surprisingly open about the use of CGI to remove his wrinkles, admitting that Pee Wee simply wouldn't work with age mixed into it. <laughs> Breakfast bar! Scone! French toast! American toast! <laughs> the hit musical dramedy Glee continued the long-standing Hollywood tradition of hiring older actors to play teenagers. Although none of the actors playing high schoolers on the show were the age they were supposed to be, they still apparently suffered from a fairly common affliction that plagues all young people – acne. This didn't zit well with the producers, who paid an unnamed visual effects company to do what was dubbed a pimple pass on most episodes to ensure every actor's skin was blemish-free. Because if there's anything that's going to make a show relatable to young people, it's flawless-looking actors with perfect skin complaining about being unattractive. Jessica Alba resolved long ago to not take off her clothes for a movie. She told Scarlet Magazine in 2010, I can act sexy and wear sexy clothes, but I can't go naked. My grandmother would freak out and throw a towel over me if she saw me wearing just a bra and panties. I can handle being sexy with clothes on, but not with them off. Anyone who watched 2010's Machete after reading the article in Scarlet was likely surprised when Alba appeared to be nude during a shower scene. But the key word there is appeared. In reality, Alba was clothed and her garments were digitally replaced in post-production with computer-generated skin. When a regular for a hit show gets pregnant, sometimes creators use the tools the universe has given them and write the pregnancy into the story. But when Claire Danes announced she was pregnant with her first child in 2012, she assured fans her Homeland character Carrie Matheson would remain fervently non-pregnant for the show's second season. Dane's onset work for season two of Homeland continued as late as six weeks before she gave birth. Her baby bump was digitally erased in post-production, and body doubles were also used to help with the subterfuge. It wouldn't be the last time Homeland used these strategies to keep a pregnancy out of the story. The following year, they used similar techniques on Morena Baccarin. Even though it didn't show up on screen, Dane's pregnancy didn't make things any easier for her. She described one particularly difficult scene that had her chained in a basement. It was 4 a.m. I was seven and a half months pregnant, oh and I was like, this sucks. <laughs> she also said the pregnancy made love scenes difficult, using the example of the shooting of one love scene when her baby was particularly active. It was like he was protesting on my husband's behalf. 
Among all the otherworldly characters in Marvel movies, the young, scrawny Steve Rogers in 2011's Captain America The First Avenger remains one of Marvel's most impressive CGI effects. No single technique was used to create the smaller and skinnier pre-experiment Steve Rogers. Marvel hired Lola Visual Effects to do the digital bodywork on Chris Evans for Captain America. Lola's supervisor Edson Williams told Variety that the so-called Benjamin Button method, or digitally attaching Evans's face to a body double, was only used for 15% of the shots. For the rest, Lola digitally shrunk Evans' face and body. The process involved shooting everything at least three times, once with Evans, once with Evans' smaller body double, and one clean shot without either of them. With each shot, the team determined whether to go the easier Benjamin Button route or what Lola came to call Steve Slimming. Williams said the most challenging part of the process was caused by Evans' massive arms. When shot in profile, they blocked an entire third of his body. So the fabric of Evans' shirts would need to be digitally erased and replaced with something else to give the illusion of skinny and comparatively weak arms. That's probably the only time in the history of superhero movies that bulking up turned out to be a bad thing. For better or worse, prequels are now a staple of film franchises, and CGI is part of what makes them possible. The filmmakers of Rogue One faced particularly tough challenges. For the story they wanted, they needed to recreate the characters of Grand Moff Tarkin and Princess Leia. Peter Cushing, who played Tarkin in 1977's Star Wars, passed away in 1994. Carrie Fisher, who portrayed Princess Leia, was still alive during the making of Rogue One, but she looked and sounded nothing like she had since about four decades had passed. So Tarkin and Leia were digitally recreated. For principal photography, Tarkin was played by British actor Guy Henry, who wore a motion capture headpiece during filming. Animators worked meticulously to recreate the actor's mannerisms. Not quite so much work was needed for the digital rebirth of Princess Leia. When seen from behind, she's fully Norwegian actress Ingvild Dela. From the front, what you see is almost entirely a digital creation though Leia's outstretched hand is Dela's. X-Men The Last Stand is not a well-loved movie among comic book fans, but at least one aspect of the film was pretty groundbreaking. The film opens with Professor X and Magneto making an early attempt to recruit Jean Grey into Xavier's school for mutants. The flashback sequence takes place around 20 years before the events of the rest of the film, and the filmmaker is one of the actor's appearances to reflect those younger days. Rather than using prosthetics or special motion capture suits, the sequence was shot as if no changes were going to be made to it at all. The VFX team then used a process called digital skin grafting to rejuvenate Stewart and McKellen, utilizing old photographs for reference as well as consulting with a plastic surgeon to learn the specifics of how skin changes as people age. Like the film that preceded it, Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 2 opens on Earth several decades in the past. We see Meredith Quill being romanced by a Kurt Russell who looks like he could have just finished filming Big Trouble in Little China. But there seems to be a little disagreement regarding how this on-screen rejuvenation was achieved. When Russell talked about the transformation, he said it was about 90% makeup and added that the filmmakers didn't do much digital manipulation. Russell says he's been working with the same makeup artist, Dennis Ledger, since 1989, and Ledger pulled off most of the work. They just did a little brush up, clean up on a couple of things, but it's pretty much what Dennis Ledger did. Writer slash director James Gunn's recollection is significantly different. In the comments section of a video Gunn posted on Facebook, the director responded to a fan question about the flashback sequence. He wrote, A company named Lola did the effects, and they did an incredible job. First, we film every scene with Kurt. A young actor, Aaron Schwartz, watches everything Kurt Russell does. He then goes in and mimics Kurt's actions. We then take Kurt's acting in general face and body and place Aaron's skin onto him. It is a long, painstaking process that took many, many months to accomplish. For all the CGI used in Captain America Civil War, the film's most stunning visual effect came in a comparatively low-key moment. An early scene in Civil War opens to what appears to be a flashback. A young Tony Stark is giving exactly the snark we expect from him as his parents Howard and Maria are about to leave for a fateful trip. Who's the homeless person on the couch? Uh, this is why I love coming home for Christmas, right before you leave town. We eventually learn we're seeing Stark's memories as they're translated through a device Stark has developed. As they did when digitally rejuvenating characters in earlier films, Marvel Studios called on Lola Visual Effects to take 20 to 25 years off Downey. 
The scene presented one of the toughest challenges Lola has had to tackle while working with Marvel because the entire sequence was filmed in a single shot. Trent Klaus, Lola's visual effects supervisor, told The Hollywood Reporter, "...the shot was nearly 4,000 frames long, with Tony Stark turning from one side to the other multiple times, physically interacting with other actors, and the set itself, and moving closer to the camera for a very long, uninterrupted close-up." Klaus went on to say that analyzing footage from Downey's late 80s film work was essential in achieving the effect, and singled out 1987's Less Than Zero as a focal point. It freaked everybody. You think I freaked me the heck out? <laughs> I mean, no, that I was, was like, my God, he was beautiful. <laughs> what happened? Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman has received her fair share of CGI assistance. The Israeli-born actor isn't capable of deflecting bullets or chucking tanks in real life, so she needs a little help to make her character a bit more believable. However, the biggest job for the effects department was to hide the miracle of life during the reshoots for Patty Jenkins' first Wonder Woman film. Gadot revealed to Entertainment Weekly that she was five months pregnant with her daughter Maya when she was required to head back to the set for additional filming. Due to her growing baby bump, the filmmakers had to find a way to work around it since a pregnancy wasn't a part of the storyline. So, the costume designers cut a gap in her costume, around the belly area, and placed a green cloth there that allowed the effects team to manipulate the visuals at a later stage. Speaking about the experience, Gadot said, "...on close-up, I looked very much like Wonder Woman. On wide shots, I looked very funny, like Wonder Woman pregnant with Kermit the Frog." They cut a big triangle and painted green. And I came to work, me and Maya, we came to work together." Martin Scorsese's The Irishman is an ambitious film, not only because it has to keep the audience's attention for almost four hours, but also because it spans five decades during its runtime. While an easier approach might have been to cast new actors for each specific era of the story, Scorsese wanted his main cast to be present throughout. Senior actor and Irishman star Robert De Niro also made it abundantly clear that he wasn't going to wear green dots or motion capture suits to make it happen, according to the Los Angeles Times. I was just doing a job to make some extra money. Industrial Light and Magic took on the challenge of creating new technology to tell the epic story. The team created a new camera rig for Scorsese to use on set, which would pick up the kind of data that would be transmitted through the tracking dots normally. Then, they would edit the shots in granular detail, including the frown and smile lines of characters such as De Niro's Frank Sheeran. However, practical effects played a major part as well. Wigs and prosthetics were utilized to add to the authenticity. The Star Wars timeline is a lot like flipping through family photo albums. Not everything is in sequential order. The stories jump around from era to era as filmmakers and showrunners cherry-pick moments in fictional history in which they will set their tales. This creates a little problem. Actors are human and humans age. No matter how good the sunscreen and skincare products they use are, an actor who was 25 three decades ago will look significantly older in modern times. Solo, a Star Wars story, solved this challenge by casting a younger actor, Alden Ehrenreich, as Han Solo. But The Mandalorian simply had to have Mark Hamill return as Luke Skywalker. We knew we wanted Mark Hamill front and center because you can't bring back Luke Skywalker without Mark Hamill. In an interview with IndieWire, Industrial Light & Magic VFX supervisor Richard Bluff explained how the team approached de-aging Hamill while trying to capture the same look as from Return of the Jedi. Hamill appeared on set in costume and performed the required actions. But there was a younger body double, Max Lloyd-Jones, who was responsible for many of the sequences as well. Essentially, the VFX crew deep-faked Hamill's face onto Lloyd-Jones for the close-up scenes. Tobey Maguire knows all about the power of CGI, having starred in the original Spider-Man trilogy. However, it isn't his time as Spidey that gives him a spot on this list. It's his appearance as the nameless hitchhiker in Terry Gilliam's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Now, why would the hitchhiker of all people in this film require any type of digital assistance, some may ask? Well, the answer involves something green, but not the kind that's placed on actors and backgrounds for VFX. No, the reason for this special effect was cold, hard cash. According to Geek, McGuire shaved off all his hair so the production could get the unique aesthetic for his character, and ended up being called back for reshoots a while later. Reportedly, McGuire had a special clause in his contract 
that stated he would be paid an extra $15,000 if he needed to shave his head again. The filmmakers decided to save some cash, so they stuck a bald cap on him and tried to digitally match the hair with the previous footage. Most of us have to pay to get our hair cut, but McGuire was lucky enough to have it the other way around. Marvel Studios is no stranger to de-aging actors, but making Samuel L. Jackson's Nick Fury look 25 years younger was a daunting task. Previously, a digitally edited character would appear for no more than a few shots, but Fury was a fundamental part of the storyline who appeared in a good number of scenes. No corners could be cut. Fortunately, there was no need for new technologies or inventions, as Lola visual effects felt comfortable enough with the task at hand. Marvel VFX supervisor Christopher Townsend explained to The Wrap that the team looked at films that Jackson starred in in the 90s, like Jurassic Park, to build their digital version of the younger Fury. But I do know that they referenced some films that I did from that time, so when I look at it, I see, you know, Danny Roman's face from Negotiator. Jackson's graceful aging provided an additional challenge to the team. Lola VFX supervisor Trent Claus elaborated, if you're working with someone like Sam, who really doesn't have a whole lot of wrinkles, you really have to rely on physiological changes, changes in structure of musculature, textures of skin, the way the weight hangs on your neck and your jaw, things over time like that we've studied for so many years now. Dwayne The Rock Johnson may look like a character from Street Fighter in the flesh, but he puts a lot of hard work into looking good on the screen and being the most electrifying man in Hollywood. However, there is a moment in the comedy Central Intelligence where Johnson plays a teenage version of his character dancing in the nude and not looking quite as shredded as he is in the real world. No, we're not going to go. This man insulted you, and we're not going to leave until he apologizes. It's, it's okay. Hey, we got a problem here? No, no. Yeah. The team behind this transformation was the celebrated Weta FX. The New Zealand-based special effects company used some smart techniques to make the scene look as authentic as possible and not too jarring to the viewer. According to Wired, Weta got popular Vine personality Sione Kalipi to dance, while they captured his performance and specific gestures. Then they brought in Johnson and Kalepi to do detailed facial scans, with which they were able to match their expressions and combine multiple performances into a single character. Since El Camino, a Breaking Bad movie, is a sequel to Breaking Bad that follows Jesse Pinkman, not many people expected Bryan Cranston's Walter White to appear, considering the fate of his character at the end of the series. However, the film does a good job of exploring the future and past, so Walter indeed makes an appearance by sitting down with Jesse in a diner scene. While Cranston never had a problem shaving his head to play Walter on the series, he did have a problem when El Camino came around, he was performing on Broadway and couldn't take a razor to his hair. The solution seemed easy enough, a bald cap. Unfortunately, it didn't look as convincing to the filmmakers as they had hoped for. In the end, the digital effects team had to take the digital brush to Walter's head to fix any issues with the bald cap, per The Hollywood Reporter. For such a simple and unassuming scene, most of it had to be recreated with visual effects.